Check, check.
Thank you, Cindy, for sharing with us this morning. Welcome to this Sunday of Epiphany, which celebrates the wise men who follow the star. It declares that Jesus is the light of the world, and it, Jesus is entitled to be called Lord of Lords and King of Kings. If you're watching via our Facebook feed, either at 8.30 or 11, we hope that you use the comment section to announce yourself and make yourself known because that's one way that we can experience some community that comes from worshiping with others at this time. It's just one small way we can continue to be connected during this pandemic. Now please join me as we share in the responsive call to worship, which will show up on your screen. Rejoice, for God has sent the Savior to the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to give hope to those who mourn, to give strength instead of a faint spirit. Arise, shine, for our light has come. We will rejoice and be glad. pray together. Lord, we're here today to remember the Magi who brought their gifts to the Christ child. How they followed the star, the wandering through a world so far from their home. And that distant hope they continued to pursue. And there they found what they're looking for. We live in a time now as we celebrate pictures of our friends and loved ones, people that we know now receiving the vaccine that reminds us that the light is there at the end of the tunnel. We pray for your faithfulness, that we continue to be careful for one another, that we continue to respect one another, and that we look forward to the days and when we can come together and form this new world that's going to be very different from what we've experienced. May we know that in all things, both the good and the bad, that your spirit is with us, will inspire us, and will renew us. Help us to continue to be creative, caring, and loving of all persons. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. We are the Chimbanda family. Our scripture reading this morning comes from a Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 to 2. Verse 8, letter A, then uh, verse 9 to 11. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in the territory of Judea, during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. They asked, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east, and that we have come to honor him. He sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search carefully for the child. When they heard the king, they went, and the look. The star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. 
When they saw the star, they were filled with the joy. They entered the house and they saw the child with Mary's mother. Falling to their knees, they honored him. Then they opened the treasure chest and they presented him with the gifts of gold, frankincense, and a mirror. We are thankful for the gift of scripture. Amen. Good morning. Welcome again to Noblesville First. I'm Matt Hantelman, one of the pastors here at Noblesville First, and I'm glad you're joining us for worship this morning. Today, the church celebrates Epiphany, which is a holiday in the Western church that celebrates the coming of the Magi to a young Jesus and represents the coming of Christ to the Gentiles. Epiphany has evolved some since its first inception, so I'd like to offer this morning a brief history of the festival and what it means for us today. The earliest celebrations of Epiphany occurred in what is now the Eastern Church. The word Epiphany in Greek means to appear or manifestation, and it's actually used in the New Testament to describe the action of Jesus coming as a baby or Jesus' second coming, Jesus coming to earth. The Eastern Church celebrated Epiphany with a festival around three manifestations of Jesus, him coming as a baby, his baptism and receiving the Spirit in the Jordan, and his first miracle at the wedding at Cana. These three events for the church represented Jesus being both fully human and fully God, and that is still what is celebrated today in what is known as the Eastern Church. Around the 4th century, the Eastern and Western churches combined their festivals, the Eastern's Epiphany and the Western's Christmas, which celebrated the birth of Jesus, and they combined them into a single, longer festival. With the Western Church celebrating Christ's birth on the 25th of December, and the Eastern Church celebrating Epiphany on January 6th, the 12 days in between became known as Christmas Tide, or what today we call the 12 Days of Christmas. The span in the Western Church continues today. We are currently in Christmas Tide. We're on that breaking point, and Epiphany is beginning. Side note, some sticklers will tell you that now the 12 days is actually the time for Christmas music, and anything before Christmas should be strictly Advent music. I think you can listen to whatever music you'd like that celebrates the birth of Jesus. With the merging of the Eastern and Western tradition, the Western Church also added a fourth manifestation that was to be celebrated which is the manifestation of Christ's opening his ministry to the Gentiles, which they represent by the visit of the Magi to present gifts to Jesus as a child. This represented non-Jewish people coming and being accepted by Jesus. Here in the West, that is the tradition that has stuck around, and we celebrate Epiphany as a remembrance of when the Magi visited, which is why it's sometimes also called Three Kings Day. We will remain in this time of Epiphany until Lent begins in February on Ash Wednesday. The United Methodist Church does maintain some of the Eastern tradition, with next Sunday being the celebration of the baptism of Christ. So what does that mean for us? How are we to celebrate the coming of the Magi to Christ with gifts. If we are staying true to the manifestation of Christ celebrated by the coming of the Magi, then we should take today to remember that Christ truly did come for all people. There are no restrictions on who may come to the Savior, and his saving power and forgiveness are extended to absolutely everyone. I believe as we leave behind a year that was full of division and strife, whether political or racial or familial or whatever, it is a needed reminder to all of us that Jesus lived, died, and rose again for all. And even for people we consider to be 
our enemies. The message of Jesus is one of love for everyone and a challenge that reminds us it is easy and expected to love those who love us. But the harder Christ-like way to live is to pour out incredible love even on our enemies. Consider these words from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who harass you so that you will be acting as children of your Father who is in heaven. He makes the sun rise on both the evil and the good and sends rain on both the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, just as your heavenly Father is complete in showing love to everyone, so you also must be complete. During this Epiphany season, I invite all of us to spend some time remembering the incredible wall-shattering love of Jesus. As we celebrate that the love of Christ is here for all, manifested in a small child that grew to show us the way to love everyone, even unto death. May we grow in our ability to live in that love. And may we consistently Ask God to help us manifest that love in every interaction we have this year. Amen. Today we give thanks for the many ways that we are continuing to do ministry with and for our community here in Noblesville. So we want to lift up for our stewardship celebration today the Layette Trees. The United Methodist women sorted all the donation items and bagged up for delivery to Touch of Love at Riverview and Life Centers. And they collected nine bags of items. So thank you so much for those who donated and we are able to celebrate as we continue to, to love on our children in the community. You can see our, our photos here. We also hit the $10,000 mark for bags, baskets, and blessings, so we celebrate that as well. If you're looking for ways to get involved here at Noblesville First, Chick-fil-A is in need of volunteers to bring donations to the church. There are Monday and Wednesday mornings scheduled for pickup, and so you can help uh, feed our community in that way. And we remind you that the end of the year giving is still possible with checks dated December 31st, which we need in the office by Friday, January the 8th. So let's finish 2020 strong, and you still have a few days to do that. We appreciate the many ways that you continue to give to our community through your prayers, your presence, your service, your gifts, and your witness. Thank you. At this time, we will pray over all the gifts that we will receive in the coming weeks and who have, we have already received as we continue to give. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the ways in which you stir us to compassion. We thank you for those who gave to the Layette trees, for those who finished 2020 strong so that we can continue to be your church. So God, continue to, to challenge us in ways that we might give. We all have something to give. Even praying for our community or for our church, our presence on social media or, or participating in worship in some way, to simply reaching out to our neighbors or to give of what we have. We are so thankful that we have you to guide us in generosity. So as we start a new year, open our hearts to the ways we will continue to give, that we might build your kingdom here on earth. We ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.
I'll never have the power to control the land or conquer half the world or claim the sun. I'll never be the kind who simply waves her hand and has a million people do the things I'd wish I'd done. But in the eyes of heaven, my place is assured. I carry with me heaven's grand design. Gloria, glory, I will sing the name of the Lord, and he will make me And I will be like Mother Mary with a blessing in my soul. And I will give the world my eyes so they can see. And I will be like Mother Mary with a blessing in my soul. And the future of the world inside of me. I carry with me heaven's grand design. Gloria, glory, I will sing the name of the Lord, and he will make me shine. And I will be like Mother Mary with a blessing in my soul and I will give the world my eyes so they can see and I will be like Mother Mary with a blessing in my soul and the future of the world inside of me and I will be like Mother Mary inside of me. Wow, that was worth showing up just for that, wasn't it? Thank you, Pastor Jill. Thank you, Pastor Matt, for capturing the essence of Epiphany. So, how many of you out there are stargazers? If you are, use the comment section and, and announce that. And how many of you got to see that convergence of Jupiter and Saturn on December 21st of this year? That is an occurrence that hasn't happened for nearly four centuries. And there are many that are kind of comparing that to the bright star of wonder that we're talking about today as we talk about the wise men who followed that star to find the Christ child. Heather Hahn of the United Methodist News Service shares a story in which she shares that planetary conjunction comparing it to the Christmas star. Astronomers have long floated the idea of a planetary conjunction or some other natural event as the possible explanation for the star that guided the Magi. And Nick Strobel is, a, is one of those among them. 
He is the physical science professor and director of the planetarium at Bakersfield College in Central California. As an astronomer and a lifelong United Methodist, he has a certain affinity with the Magi that we're talking about today. He, he shares this statement, we both have a love of the night sky and we search for a place or person where heaven and earth meet and we both found that in the person of Jesus. Strubble says the last time Jupiter and Saturn came together like this was in July of 1623. That'd be about the time the pilgrims were settling in New England. Our scripture from the book of Matthew does not share how many magi there were and does not call them kings. That's something that came along later. It's not actually in the Bible, but became part of the tradition. But one thing we do know for sure is that the Magi found the newborn king by following a star. The ancients believed that God would make destiny manifest in the star, so it's not a surprise that Jesus' birth was accompanied by the appearance of his star in the very fabric of the heavens. It's been a great source of speculation as to the exact nature of what the Magi saw on that first Christmas. Strubble's got his own theories. He starts using the guesswork that we have for about when Jesus was born, and most biblical scholars aim that somewhere between the year 7 and 4 B.C. Strubble thinks a planetary conjunction is the most likely prospect for the Nativity star, and he does know that in late May, late September, in early December of 7 B.C., Jupiter and Saturn moved past each other three times. Such an occurrence happens only once every 900 years. The following February, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, all three, formed a near conjunction which happens once every 800 years. So the combination of Jupiter and Saturn would also have been pretty interesting theologically because astrologers in the Near East believe that Jupiter symbolized royalty and Saturn would represent the deity that overlooked and protected Israel. In addition, ancient astrologers associated the constellation Pisces, where these conjunctions occurred, with the Jewish people. One more possible explanation for the star Bethlehem occurred in 5 BC, because that year Jupiter, instead of wandering eastward as planets tend to do, seemed to stop and go backwards in what astronomers call a retrograde motion. In 5 BC, the Earth passed Jupiter, and it appeared to be stationary for about a week, which would be perfect for hovering over a momentous birth. Now, I share all that just to let you know that our Christmas stories are not fairy tales. They're grounded in history, a history that declares that God has done something very special in coming to Earth in the person of Jesus, whom we now call the Christ. So what do we learn about our faith from these magi? I think we learn lots of things. If you read the Luke birth narratives, we hear that shepherds were invited to come and witness the birth of Christ, probably the first witnesses. Later, the magi would come along. So in Luke, we find poor shepherds, and in Matthew, we find financially secure, highly educated men from the east who have the resources to travel from the Fertile Crescent, some 1,200 miles, a journey they would take 100 days via caravan, 100 days to come to that birth and 100 days to go home. It's a journey that would have come at no small personal cost. So if you put Matthew and Luke together, here's what we have. Jesus came for the rich and the poor, for the uneducated and those who spent their lives studying. He came for the Jews and also for the people of other faiths who are earnestly seeking the truth. These magi were the first of many Gentiles, non-Jews, who will kneel at the feet of Jesus to honor him. The magi were most likely followers of the religion Zoroastrianism, a religion that is still present in modern-day Iran, about 30,000 followers in that country. So these magi show us God's deep concern for people who were even of another faith. 
This story shows a, it just says so much about the wideness of God's mercy. The Zoroastrians may have shared many things in common with the Jews and their beliefs, but there are also many things that they were very different. Yet God in God's mercy saw the earnestness of their faith, beckoned them and blessed them, and then he used them to care for the infant Jesus as they brought their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. If only Christians would be as tolerant of other faith seekers whose beliefs don't match ours 100%. Matthew clearly has included the birth narrative of the Magi to declare that Jesus is born for all persons on the earth. The good news of Jesus Christ is intended for all nations and all peoples on earth. And here's the last thing we learn from the Magi. I mean, they should inspire us. When you think about the mindset of those Magi, there is much for us to emulate. Here are men who already have everything they need on this earth. They have the resources to have expensive gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh to be able to travel that journey says that they had plenty of financial gifts. And yet, their focus is on the heavens for answers to the problems that still plagued their time. They were looking for a Messiah, someone who would be the answer for the people of their day. And they studied the heavens so intently, they saw something that most that day never paid attention to. Something so rare, they knew what they were witnessing was extraordinary, and they chose to pursue it with a passion that few others would. They've invested most of the year of their very short lives to find the person that star would point to. And their search was rewarded, but they didn't come empty-handed. They came and brought gifts fit for a king, and many scholars believe these very gifts provided the means for the Holy Family to flee Palestine, to go to Egypt until it was safe to return to Nazareth. So what do the Magi teach you about your faith journey? How much time do you spend in spiritual pursuits? I, I'm not talking about stargazing. But what about looking where your lives are heading? What in your lives are genuine spiritual pursuits? Are you using your financial privilege to bring gifts to our Lord that can alter the lives of people whom God loves? We're living in unprecedented times. This virus has turned our lives upside down. We're experiencing something so rare that it will forever change how we see the world and one another. So what lessons have we learned from this? I hope each of us ask every day, what does God want me to learn from the challenges that have been placed in our lives in this time? As we move into 2021 and look forward to our lives returning to normal, I pray that our goal will not be simply to go back to the way things were, but we'll work for a better world, a world more just, more caring, and more aware of what really matters. I hope you ask yourself, what gifts God is calling me to bring into this new year? The Magi brought gifts which declare Jesus is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. What gifts will you bring and how far are you willing to go to bring those gifts into reality? Let's pray. Lord, bring your spirit into our lives. May we find that passion that the Magi had to pursue a great cost, that promise, that hope, the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. May we pursue Jesus in our lives. May we work to emulate all that God has done and to love others as you love them, all persons, without exception. This is our prayer in the name of Christ, who is our Lord. Amen. At this time, we lift up a number of persons and situations in our congregation and our community in need of prayer. 
as well as those of you who are watching on our live stream this morning, make sure if you have a prayer concern, please voice that and we will lift those up as our, our hosts from our church staff will be happy to let us know and to pray for you as well. This week, we have a sympathy for the Verbrugge family. Mark's mother, Rosemary, um, passed away last Sunday. We continue to have people affected by COVID-19 who are um, struggling or recovering. Many in our congregations, we lift them up as well, as well as all of those who are grieving, especially as we begin a new year. I know many of us are pondering what this new year will bring. So whatever, whatever joys, anxieties, or concerns that you have upon your heart this morning, I hope you will lift them to God as we pray together. And now at this time, please join me in our call to prayer. God of light and life, we praise you for your creation and for the word made flesh in the child born in Bethlehem. Open our hearts and minds in this time of worship. Just as you led the Magi by the star, lead us by your spirit beyond the limits of this world's expectations. To the life where you make all things new, through Christ our morning star. Amen. Let's continue to pray first in silence, then we will have a pastoral prayer, and then we will say the Lord's Prayer together. Let us pray. Merciful God, for many of us, it is a day of new beginnings, a new year, a chance to start fresh, a time to turn over a new leaf, we are inspired by hopefulness. We are inspired by the light of a star. We are inspired by faith journeys. And we are alive with the anticipation of what this new year might hold. Yet we also know that for many others, many of us, today is just another day of struggle. And tomorrow might be more of the same. We lift up those with chronic pain, addictions or relationship issues that are no less abated because it is now a new year. We lift up those affected by the pandemic around our world, knowing that hope is in the future, yet sometimes it seems far away. We also acknowledge that steady employment and financial resources are not any more abundant for the same reasons. So, Lord, give us eyes to see our neighbors, to look beyond the safety and comfort of our own lives in order to experience the uncertainty and fear that plague much of our world. Disquiet us with the scandal of injustice, inequity, and human misery so that following the example of Christ, our morning star, our light of the world, our Savior, that we might choose to suffer alongside those who suffer and become bearers of peace, comfort, and hope. We lift up those, O oh God, who we've named this morning, whether aloud or in our hearts or on our live stream worship. We ask for your spirit of peace that passes all understanding. We lift up our own fears and anxieties as we begin a new year. We open our eyes to the joys in our lives for the things that we know mean happiness and peace and will bring joy and light to others. So in the name of Jesus Christ, our morning star, we ask all of this and so much more with the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today is a day that we also celebrate communion together. So if you are at home, I invite you to grab something that represents the presence of Christ in your life. It could be a cracker, it could be a goldfish cracker, it could be bread. I'm using a tortilla today. Whatever speaks to you that might represent the, the wine, the juice, and the bread that we have to represent the body and blood of Christ. So let us now gather at our tables wherever they may be. And may we remember the story that brings us to the table, that Jesus shared a very special meal with his friends. And at that meal, he took bread. He gave thanks to God, he blessed it, and then he broke it. And he passed it to his friends and he said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup. He gave thanks to God. He blessed it. And then he gave it to his friends and said, Drink from this, all of you. For this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit to be upon all of us gathered together, wherever we are, and upon these gifts of bread and cup. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world representatives of Christ in the world. On this new year, on this Epiphany Sunday, O oh God, we are reminded of the ways that you journey with us the ways that you guide us, the ways that you help sustain us even in the most difficult moments and seasons. So we give thanks for these gifts, that we might encounter you once again through them, that we will be receptors of your grace, and that we will leave the table inspired and ready to follow that star wherever it may lead us. We ask your blessing upon our time of communion and upon these gifts as we gather, we celebrate, and we encounter you once more. Amen. So now I invite you to take whatever it is that you have and remember the body of Christ broken for you. And I'll take the cup and remember the cup of salvation. And let us pray. We thank you, O oh God, for these gifts. We thank you that technology allows us to participate in communion in this way. Perhaps we are gathered with family. Perhaps we are enjoying a quiet moment alone in your presence. So we thank you by the Holy Spirit, O oh God, you have blessed us and brought us together. May we forever be grateful for these gifts that we might remember, that we might encounter you. Amen.
few announcements to send you on your way. Again, remember, the end of your giving is vital to our Noblesville First Ministries as this pandemic has impacted us severely this year. You can still mail or bring in checks dated December 31st as long as we receive them by this Friday, January the 8th. We have available at the church Teeter Cookbooks for $15, which is organized by and our recipes are based upon the vegetables that we get out at Teeter. So it's a unique cookbook. We hope that you'll uh, come to the church office or call and make arrangements to pick one up. We also have a few Noblesville First Mass still available for $10. Remember, half of the profits go to the Walk Behind Tractor at Teeter. And the vineyard continues to expand. If you're feeling lonely this season or overwhelmed from all this COVID isolation, this is a great way to connect with others in the congregation. The vineyard provides online and socially distanced in-person branches. So reach out by emailing care at noblesofirst.com and we will get you connected with the branch. Our next Noblesville First blood drive is scheduled for Monday, January 25th from 3 to 6 p.m. So please, for now, put that date on your calendar. We'll get the links up this week for you to register and make your appointment for that online uh, donation. It's uh, vital for us in this time as they certainly have been challenged trying to keep the blood supply up. And Grief Share starts next Sunday, January the 10th from 4 to 6 p.m. It's offered in person and also via Zoom. You can do either option, but you'll need to register by going to the link that we have on our Noblesville First webpage, or you can contact Carol Miller at cmiller at noblesvillefirst.com. And if you're new to our on online community, we hope that you'll reach out to Bonnie Zickcraft, uh, either put a mention in the Facebook comment section, or email her directly at bzickcraft at noblesvillefirst.com, and she'll get in touch with you and help you get connected to our Noblesville First Ministries. In that spirit, let us go forth as the people of God, people willing to follow a star through a far and distant land. May we have that passion this week for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. <laughs>